Thank you for joining our church online. We encourage you to visit citylightla.church for our service times, location, and upcoming events. If you enjoy our videos and would like to give to lives being changed in Los Angeles, visit citylightla.church slash give. You may be seated. I invite you to be seated this morning. Um, happy Mother's Day uh, to everyone today. Um, my name is Jared, and if I have not got the chance to meet you before, um, hello. Uh, I have been uh, coming here to City Light um, just over four years. Now, I know if you were here last week, uh, Pastor Alberto said that, but technically I was here before he was, so just by a couple weeks. So I beat him by a few weeks. Um, but me and my wife have been, and now my three daughters have been coming to City Light for four years, and uh, I'm very thankful and privileged to have the opportunity to preach to you this morning. Um, if you have your Bibles this morning, open to the book of 1 John. And we're going to be in the book of 1 John. We've been uh, studying the book, the book of 1 John for the past couple uh, months now. Um, if you don't have a Bible this morning, that's okay. Uh, in the seat back in front of you, there is a black hardback copy of the Word of God. And we want to give that to you this morning. We want that to be your gift um, this morning. If you don't have a Bible, I want to encourage you to take that Bible. Uh, no, don't just take it and, and, and leave it at your house and then bring it back on Sunday morning next week. Open the Bible, read the, read the Bible, study the Bible, make the Bible a part of your everyday life. And we say this at City Light often, but we are a Bible opening church. We come every single week to hear what the Bible has to say. Um, we're not here to open, a ver open the Bible, read a verse, and then hear a motivational speech. Um, we want to hear what God has for us. And we believe the Bible has the ultimate and supreme authority. And it's relevant for us today. It's written by a God. It's written by a God who loves us. We sang about that all this morning. It's written by a God who loves us. And it's for us so that we may know and experience the person of God in a deeper, more intimate way. So keep that in mind this morning as we open up the word of God and, re and read it. These are the words of God for us, and we should treat it as such. And as I mentioned, we're in a study of the book of 1 John. And, and John writes this book, and we are studying this book line by line, paragraph by paragraph, and we're calling this study Reclaiming Assurance. John writes this book to churches in his day in Asia Minor, and he says to them in chapter 5, verse 13, this is the theme of the book, he says this, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that you have eternal life. So John is writing this book to churches under the attack of of a teaching in the, in, in the uh, Bible days called, known as Gnosticism. And it was attacking, it's a false doctrine, attacking the deity of Christ and the work of the gospel. So he's writing this book to not only strengthen, but to encourage believers that their assurance and confidence would be strong, that they know who, they, that they know who Jesus is, and they can be confident of who they are in Christ. So line after line, paragraph after paragraph, this is a book written to help Christ followers reclaim their assurance in Christ. And we're going to be in John chapter 3, verses 11 through 18 this morning. All of us at some point in our life, maybe you're right in the middle of it right now, have gone through maybe what we call a crisis identity, right? You're trying to figure yourself out. Who am I? Where do I fit in? Where do I fit into my family? Where do I, where do I fit into my friend group? Uh, maybe in high school you wanted to be the popular kid. You wanted to be the, the kid that, you know, was the best sports player. You, you dated the prettiest girl in school. Nowadays, you want to be the best gamer, right? That's, that's the thing in high school nowadays. Um, but maybe um, in your life today, you're like, hey, I want to be known as having the best job. I want to have the best car. I want to have the biggest house on my street. And maybe it's maintaining a certain level of success or wealth. But what makes you confident in your identity is when there is validation or evidence of that identity, right? That's what makes you confident of that identity. I follow an Instagram page called Be a Man. If you're a man here today, I would encourage you to follow that page. Um, it's a funny page, and, it, and, it, and it's, it's, it's humorous, and it, and it puts a light on what's it like to be a real man. There's a guy that gets on there, and he just, he just reads a quote for 10 seconds, and that's it. That's the video. He'll say things like, if you have a heart attack, finish your workout. Be a man right? She says dumb things like that. Um, and I'm not saying to do that this morning, but we, we seek for, for identity. And he's saying, hey, if you're going to be a man, this should be your identity. There should be proof or evidence that you're a man. And John this morning is not only going to give us a clear and visible identity of what a Jesus follower looks like, but he's going to provide us and show us proof 
of that identity in our lives. Remember, this book is written to give us assurance and proof and evidence of in our lives, hey, I am a follower of Christ, and because of, I know I'm a follower of Christ. So we're going to be reading in John chapter 3, 11 for the verse 11 through 18. It's page 960 in the black hardback copy, if you're not sure where, where the, that book is. But John chapter 3, 11, verse 18, let's begin reading this morning. Verse 11 says, For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. We should not be like Cain, who was, one of the, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brother's righteous. Do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. Whoever does not abide, whoever does not love, abides in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Verse 16, by this we know love, that he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. The big idea we're going to look at this morning that sits over these two passages, this text this morning is this. Gospel love for the church identifies and assures the follower of Christ. Gospel love for the church identifies and assures the follower of Christ. Being precedes doing. But all Christian doing must be based on being. Who you are in Christ determines how you behave, how you live. Our practice proclaims who and what we are. And so in this passage, we're going to look and see why love is an identifying mark and the evidence of our identity in Christ. So we asked this question this morning, well, why? Why is this statement true? And if you're taking notes this morning, you can write it down this way. A true Christ follower loves, number one, by obeying the message. A true Christ follower loves by obeying the message. When you and I become followers of Christ, we now live under the authority of King Jesus. Before we were in Christ, we, we did what we wanted to do. We lived how we wanted to live. And John is saying an identity that all Christians should have, the entire church should have, is that they love one another and they actually practice it. It sounds like a, a cliche, right? But it's not. John says if we say we love then we will follow and obey the message to do it. And we will learn today that true love requires action. True love requires action. Before we were into a relationship with Christ, we were leaders of our lives. We did what was right in our own eyes. But as a true follower of Christ, you and I now live under and obey this message that is to love one another. Look at verse 11. For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. What is the message? It's pretty clear, pretty clear that you should love one another. John is just actually repeating what Jesus told his followers while he was on earth. Look at John chapter 13, verse 34. It should be on the screen. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You are also to love one another. The whole premise or foundation, which is, taking, or which is taken after Jesus' is teaching. John saying, as a believer, your love for the church, your love for each other. Look around the room, your love for people on your left, on your right, in front of you, behind you. Your love for those people identifies as your truest identity as a child of God. The four at the beginning of the verse is, 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 uh, means this verse is a continuation. So if you look back at verse 10, just above verse 11, it says this, by this it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God nor is the one who does not love his brother. So as John does for this entire passage, he, he makes a, a contrast. John's very black and white in his description of, the word, of, of what, it, what it means to be a child of God. He says an evidence of a child of God is that they love their, their, their brother or their spiritual family. As children of God, we love the family of God. Love for one another is at the very heart of the gospel. We sang this morning about through love, because of love, because of God's love for us, he came to earth, he came and died for us. Love is at the very heart of the gospel. 
If you have been changed, if you've accepted the gospel into your heart, you cannot help but love. And an evidence of that is that not, not, not that you love the world, the people around you, the people outside these walls, but the people in this church, the people in your life group, the people in your serve group, the people that you worship with every single Sunday morning, that you're here, that every time you gather, those are the people that you love because you are a child of God. John says, from the beginning, why does he say from the beginning? Well, John is saying that from the beginning of your relationship with Christ, you have received the love of Christ. Therefore, you now share the love of Christ. If we look at the first verse of, of this chapter, what do we see? John says, see what kind of love the Father has what? Given to us that we should be called the children of God. Church family, the love we show the family of God, which is evident, which is an evidence of our salvation, starts with God's love for us. Now you might be thinking this morning, well, you don't have to be a Christian in order to love, right? I, it, the church doesn't have monopoly on love, right? It's not like only Christians can love. Is that what you're saying this morning? No, no, it's not what I'm saying. Um, but here's the truth. Here's the reality. Love in its purest form begins to flow only at the beginning of your relationship with Christ. John says it very clearly. There is a difference between the love of a Christian and a non-Christian. There is a difference. All love comes from God. But love in a fallen state, which is everyone before Christ. Remember, in the darkness I was waiting without hope and without light. Before Christ's love came into our heart, we were without Christ. We did not have the love of Christ in our heart, in our life. All love comes from Christ, but in a fallen state, which is everyone before Christ, love becomes distorted and self-centered. When you enter into a relationship with Christ, listen, change will happen. Change will happen. It will be evident. That coworker that you hate, maybe you still hate him a little bit, <laughs> but when you accept Christ into your heart, into your life, you will begin to love. You will begin to question, how is this even possible? There will be change in your heart. There will be change in your life. The family member that turned their back on you in your darkest hour, the one that maybe you've been holding a grudge with for the last 15 years, Last 20 years, when you enter into a loving relationship with Christ, that will be evident in your life. Change will be evident in your life. Now, I know I'm saying this word love a lot, right? It is Mother's Day, okay? We are at church. We can talk about love, right? But what does this word mean? Let's not just pass over this word love. As I said earlier, this is a supernatural love. This love does not originate with us and it for sure does not rely on our own strength to live out. This love is from God and empowered by God. My daughter, who, one of my daughters, okay, I have, I have three daughters. Um, uh, my daughter, who's two and a half year, years old, is mesmerized at this point in her life by High School Musical, okay? So don't judge me out there, okay? I know me and my wife talked about it. We made a mistake by letting her you know, indulge in high school musical, but she loves musicals. She loves to sing and dance and all these things, but she's enamored by high school musical. She can't get enough of it. She wants to just watch it and listen to the songs all day long. And, and thanks to that, now I've seen all three high school musicals. So <laughs> it's, it's great. Um, but it, it's funny to watch her as a two and a half year old. I see her wrestling with this idea of love right? Because High School Musical, it's about the, the Troy and Gabriella and, and uh, Chad and Taylor. I can't believe I know these things, right? But it, it's about how they, uh, high school relationships and love. And I, and I can see her like trying to comprehend what it means. This is not the love John's talking about here, okay? Not a, a warm, fuzzy feeling, not a brotherly love, right? That's based on affection. He uses a different word for love, which is agape, it's a higher meaning of love, and it's, and it's whose example we see in Christ. I'm going to read for you an article that I read um, called What is Agape Love? Oh, here's what the author writes. Agape is a love that is willing to sacrifice oneself for the benefit of that brother. A love that causes one to be long-suffering toward him. A love that makes one treat him kindly. A love that so causes one to rejoice in the welfare of another that there is no room for envy in the heart a love that is not jealous, a love that keeps one from boasting of oneself, a love that keeps, keeps one from bearing oneself in a lofty manner, a love that keeps one 
from being unbecomingly, a love that keeps one from seeking one's own rights, a love that keeps one from becoming angry, a love that does not impute evil, a love that does not rejoice in iniquity but in the truth, a love that bears up against all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. That is the kind of love which God says one Christian should have for one another. That's a lot to take in. (laughs) That's a lot of things I just mentioned, but that's the kind of love we can have through the spirit, through the power of Christ, and through his love for us in our lives. So why do we obey this message? Because we have come under the authority of Jesus Christ, and now we have love for one another. The message of love one another comes from the command of God, and we are compelled by his command. Our love for one another is demanded by the character of God, but it is also empowered by God who is love. And a true Christ follower has evidence of obedience of the message to love one another. City Light, if we consist this morning of true followers of Christ, we ought to be a church that obeys the command of loving one another. There ought to be evidence of changed lives all around this place is because of how we obey the message of loving one another. Listen, it's an incredible thing to be a part of a go and tell project, right? And we just saw an amazing video a few weeks ago about how we were able to help the church in East LA renovate its building and be on mission for Christ. And if you're someone here today that's not yet a part of the family of God, yes, we welcome you and we love you. But listen, we ought to be a church that loves each other. There ought to be love within these walls. Love should not just be outpouring. Love should be inside. Love should be pouring from one another in this this body right here. That is what identifies you as a true follower of Christ. Gospel love for the church identifies and assures the follower of Christ. Number one, we see a true Christ follower loves by obeying the message. Number two, A true Christ follower loves by opposing the spirit of Cain. John takes a complete 180 and goes in the opposite direction. John, as we can see in his writing, he would no doubt be a person that liked to argue in extremes. I don't know if that's that's you. Maybe you hate people that argue in extremes. I like to argue in extremes, right? I want to go from, well, if this can't, if this isn't true, then it's gotta be true, right? That's that's the way I like to argue. It could be frustrating. But John is saying, hey, John is saying, hey, there's, there's proof, there's evidence, and if one is not true, if one is true, one must not be true. John is very much this person. He continually says, if one thing is true, another is not. We find no middle ground. There is no middle ground when it comes to salvation. There is no middle ground when it comes to being in Christ. Let's look at it this morning. Look at verse 12. He says it plain as day. We should not be like Cain who was one of the evil one, and murdered his brother. Now Cain, if you don't know who Cain is, Cain was born to Adam and Eve. He was literally the first human being ever born. Adam and Eve were created, and they created, they created Cain. Cain's was human being number one. And Abel, his brother, human, human being number two, Cain ushers in murder as the first person ever born. So John is writing to multiple churches, and he says, hey guys, don't be like Cain. If you're here this morning, you're like, all right, I got it. Got it, Jared. Good. Don't worry. I'm not, I'm not planning on killing anybody anytime soon, okay? And maybe the churches back there were like, we get it, John. Like, man, what kind of church was it back in the day? Going around killing each other. Like, we're not going to do that. We're not going to kill people. It might seem extreme, but John knows exactly what he's saying here. The story of Cain and Abel is that they both bring an offering to God. God accepts Abel's sacrifice in faith, and he rejects Cain. Look back at verse 12. What does John keep saying? He says, why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brother's righteous. Man, a classic case of sibling rivalry, right? Cain was jealous of his brother Abel. God accepted Abel's sacrifice. He rejected Cain's. Abel sacrificed in faith. Cain did not. I have three brothers, okay? So there's four of us. I have three brothers and everything Everything, every, every game, every time we played in our house, everything was a competition, okay? All right, and every time we played something, every game we did, always ended in a fight, okay? Always ended in a fight, typically. All right, that's how you knew it was a competitive game if it ended in a fight. And we all are competitive, so we, we, we always ended in fights. 
I can remember this day when I was a high schooler. The anger I felt in my heart when me and my brother both liked the same girl and he was winning the battle, okay? I can remember that feeling in my heart to this day, okay? So what is the spirit of Cain? If if I'm going to say we shouldn't have the spirit of Cain, what is the spirit of Cain? Well, we see Cain becomes very angry, becomes jealous of his brother, and in his anger and jealousy, he brutally kills his brother by what we know from from different um, uh, writings and and, and, uh, understanding the word behind and the phrase behind that word killing his brother. He slit his throat. Brutal murder. Brutal murder. Cain horribly murdered his brother. He planned it. We know it was a premeditated murder. And after Cain commits the murder, we see God come back to him and ask him this question. We ask him a question, and he says, where's, where's Abel? And what does Cain say? Am I my brother's keeper? You know what the answer is this morning? Yes. That's your brother. That's your brother. You're your brother's keeper. If love characterizes the child of God, then hate characterizes the child of the devil or the evil one. There's no middle ground here. John says, you're one or the other. Hey, you're one or the other. Listen, church, listen, Christ follow. There not ought to be any sibling rivalry going on here at City Light. We're all brothers and sisters. We're all the family of God. There's no space. There's no room. There's no no room for uh, uh, sibling rivalry that can lead you to a dark place. Anger, uh, uh, jealousy, envy can lead you to a dark place. If we're not careful, we can allow the spirit of Cain to creep into our church. None of us are immune to it. Maybe some of you in this room right now are experiencing bitterness or envy or jealousy or even hate towards a sister or brother in this room. Get it right today. Don't wait. Get it right today. A true follower of Christ opposes the spirit of Cain. Listen, I'll be honest. The battle of jealousy, battle of envy has been one I've been fighting in my life for a long time. And there's been times when I've had to go to people in this room and apologize. And I'm not lifting myself up. I'm not, I'm not boasting of how great I am. But I am saying I can see evidence of growth and change in my heart. A true follower of Christ will oppose the spirit of Cain. It is a sinful inclination of a corrupt mind to hate the other person. That's why it's necessary for God and John to repeatedly tell us, love one another, love one another, love one another. Cain, the first person ever born from a man and a woman, is our example of what will be totally absent from the life of a child of God. John continues, look at verse 13. He says this, do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. John says, hey, you used to be of Cain. You and I used to be accepted by the world. Now we are rejected by the world. Jesus says this, Over and over again, there's an ancient proverb that says this, you can judge a man's character by who his enemies are. Jesus says in in John 15, 19, if you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. We cannot be shocked. We cannot be appalled. We cannot marvel at the fact that the world hates us. That's just another evidence of who we are in Christ. As we look back at verse 14, John goes back to the competing argument. John's just all over the place, back and forth, back and forth. He says this, we know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in death. We know. True gospel transformation is not something that you, you're like, oh, I, I, feel, I feel that I'm saved. I, I really, I, I believe it. No, John says you can know. You can know beyond a shadow of a doubt. We can have confidence. It is a proof to us that we love the brothers. We have passed from death to life. This is the knowledge obtained by experience. We have been made alive in Christ. And what's the evidence of that? That we love the brothers. That's the evidence of that in our lives. You know, sometimes we, we read the Bible, and I do this. We read the Bible, and maybe you've read a passage before. You just kind of skim over the passage. You're like, all right, what's in it for me this morning? Right? What, what can I get from this passage today? Let me read it from one perspective. But let's, let's just pause real quick and let's take a look at who this author is, John. John, if I was to ask many of you in the room, John was called the disciple of what? Disciple of love, right? John is identified by love, man. This guy talks about love. He breathes love. He sleeps love. He's love all over the place. But, but what do we know about John? 
John's language changed occasionally in this passage, and, and in this verse specifically, verse 14, he changes from you to we. John's talking about his own personal experience in his own life. You see, John and his brother James were actually given the nickname by Jesus, the sons of thunder. Why? Because they were always so ready to retaliate against the Pharisees. John and James, the sons of thunder, they wanted to retaliate. In Luke 9, John and James told Jesus to burn down an entire city just because they rejected Jesus. John's like, oh, they don't want you? Let's just burn them down. Let's just get rid of them, man. Does that sound like a guy that loves? Does that sound like a guy that's been identified by love? I don't think so. John was not always a man, this man of love, but in Christ, he grew in his love and therefore his assurance of his standing in Christ. Think about this. Think about this for a second. John even loved the disciples who turned their back on Jesus when he went to the cross. What do we know? John was the only disciple, the only disciple from from the record of the Bible. He was the only disciple that followed Jesus to the cross. He was there. Peter denied Jesus. Do you think John had to come to a point in his heart, in his life, where he says, I forgive you, I still love you? My, My brothers, the 12 that I, the 11 that I walked with, For the last three years of my life, you just turned your back on this man? You think John had to get to a point where he he overcame that hate or lifted himself up and said, I'm better than all of you because I didn't turn my back on Jesus? John is speaking from experience here. He says, hey, I know I've passed from death into life because I love the brothers. And listen, family, you this morning will have confidence in your faith, will have confidence in your hope in Christ when you love the family of God. It is a clear, clear evidence in your life when you love the people in the church that you are a child of God. John grew in his ability to love. He had a gospel transformation in his life with with how he grew to love others. I was at lunch with someone a few weeks ago, and we're talking about how difficult and how hard it is can be uh, to love family sometimes, (laughs) right? The ones we say we love are the hardest to love, you know? A few weeks ago, I had... All of my family at my house, okay? There was 18 of us in my house. And within one week, 16 out of the 18 of us, all were either throwing up or doing other things and were just completely sick for the whole week. It was supposed to be a fun week, a week of vacation. No. Boom. Down. Horrible week. In fact, there's a, there's a giant stain on one of my carpets. Yeah. Yeah. It's hard to love family sometimes, you know? <laughs> it's not easy. Family, will be, family there will be times in our lives when, we, when the people we selflessly and sacrificially love will let us down, betray us, turn their back on us, or even just simply annoy us and make us angry. People in this room, when we have the love of the Holy Spirit, we can oppose the spirit of Cain and give us hope and assurance of who we are in Christ. John ties off this section of scripture with this this stern warning in verse 15. Let's look at verse 14. He says this, everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. That's a powerful verse right there. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer? Is John exaggerating here? No, this is a literal verse. He's being very literal. He's not being hypothetical. John, in the words of Jesus, through the power of the Holy and the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, goes to the heart of the issue, which is the heart. He's referring back to Jesus' teaching in Matthew 5. Not just murder with the hands, but murder with the heart. You might be sitting here this morning when I said, don't be like Cain. You're like, check, <laughs> got it. I'm not going to kill my brother. I'm not going to kill anybody in this room. And John says, whoa, whoa, hold on now, hold on now. It's a problem of the heart. Jesus says hating them is just the same. You might say, I never kill anybody. Jesus says hating them is just the same. We look at Matthew chapter 5, 21 and 22. Jesus is preaching the famous Sermon on the Mount. And he's combating the hypocritical ways the Jewish people were living. Saying and pretending to do one thing, but having a wicked and evil heart. Look at what he says. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. That's a commandment, right? Do not kill. 
That's a commandment. Listen to what Jesus says. But I say to you, everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Jesus here shows the comparison of the heart of the murderer and the heart of the one who hates. What, what is our application for us today? There is no place for hate in the heart of the child of God. John clearly says, anyone who does not love his brother hates him, and whoever hates his brother is a murderer. James chapter four, verse two says this, you desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and you quarrel. There's that envy creeping up again, which James says leads to murder. Jealousy leading to bickering and fighting. It is the heart that is the problem. Church, your love for the family of God is proof of your salvation. As a true Christ follower, you oppose the spirit of Cain that is jealousy, hate, anger, envy, which is murder with the heart. So we know this entire book is to help give us confidence as believers. And John, again, gives us a strong contrast as we finish this morning. He wants to help us understand. He wants us to get it. So here's what he tells us. Don't be like Cain. Don't be like Cain. And then what does he finally say? He says, let's look at the best example we could possibly have. Gospel love for the church identifies and assures the follower of Christ. A true follower of Christ loves by obeying the message. A true follower of Christ loves by opposing the spirit of Cain. And finally this morning, a true Christ follower loves by offering up themselves. Look at verse 16. Beautiful verse. By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brother. John's final contrast is this. Hey, don't be like Cain who killed his brother, who was full of hate. Be like Christ. That is the love that we follow. Christ offered up his life for us and we ought to, we ought to offer up our lives for the family of God. This is the agape love we talked about, a beautiful passage that describes this selfless, selfless love as Philippians chapter two, verses one through eight. Go study it this week. Paul writes that because of love, Jesus gave up all the glory of heaven humbled himself and took on the lowliest form of man and then died an absolutely cruel and horrific death because he loved us. That is the example we are meant to follow. John says that is the kind of love we will display if we are in Christ. A true Christ follower will offer up every part of their life in the same form and fashion that Jesus demonstrated. He says Jesus is love. Jesus, Jesus says that the love, that's the love that God imparts upon us and then expects from us. This is the love that we ought to give and receive to the people in this room. The identity of this local church and the body of believers should be man. That church, City Light, on victory, across from Baskin Robbins, because everybody knows where the Baskin Robbins on victory is, right? That's how I always describe where City Light's at. That church, they love each other with some crazy kind of love I've never heard of before. The world and other believers should look at this church and say, yep, those are God's disciples indeed because they love one another. They offer up their well-being, their comfort, their time, their money, their talent, their homes, their cars. They offer up their entire lives for the livelihood of one another. That is the kind of love we will display if we are in Christ. Yes, we do community work. Yes, we love those that might not be a part of the body of Christ yet, but they are without a doubt followers of Christ because they have and love and show love for one another. That should be the S on our chest, right? That should be our identity, that we love one another and we offer up ourselves for the body of Christ. Look at verses 17 and 18, or verse 17, it says this, but if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? John gives us this negative illustration again. He's calling us to do the opposite. Listen, I think we've heard this and I think we understand this this morning, but simply not doing evil is not good enough. Simply not doing evil is not good enough. The love we have calls us to action. He said, if you have the love of God, you will see evidence of selfless, sacrificial love in your, art, in, in, in your life. And I, I love what John does is he gets specific. He's not gonna let us hide behind a general statement. Oh yeah, I love, I love everybody. Yeah, I love, yeah, of course. I mean, I'm, I'm a Christian. I just, I love the body of Christ. Of course, yeah. John doesn't say, hey, those of you that are rich in the world's goods, make sure you share 
out of your abundance of wealth. What does he say? No, he doesn't say that. He says, whoever has the world's goods. What, what, what is the world's goods? It's basic necessities. Water, food, clothing, shelter. I, I mean, I look around and all of us are clothed this morning, right? We all have something. We all got here one way or another, right? We're alive, which means we have sustenance. We have food, we have water. John isn't calling for those that are overflowing with goods to, 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 to be willing to share. He says we should be willing to sacrifice. He says that if you have them, if you have the world's goods, we need to open up what? He, he goes again, he goes again to the, 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 the meaning that we want to grasp here. Open up our hearts. Open up our hearts. Listen, church, we are growing as a church. Every week, we're having more and more people come to City Light. Are you opening up your friend group this morning? Are you falling into a click of like, hey, my four and no more? That's not the kind of love we display as Christ followers. We welcome the family of Christ. We welcome the body of Christ. We love the body of Christ. Listen, where there is love, there are open hearts for the church family. Finally, John ties off this passage with a strong reminder. John is an old man at this point in his life. He's speaking as a grandpa again. He says, little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. What's he saying? He says, hey, your, your walk talks louder than your talk talks. He says, don't, be, don't, 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 don't talk about it, be about it. We ought to profess, listen, we ought to profess and tell each other we love each other, okay? That's a good thing. We should say that, right? I can't get away with just telling my wife, you know I love you. I, I pay the bills, right? It's not going to work, okay? We ought to profess. We ought to say. We ought to verbalize our love for one another, okay? But let not our love stop with words. Where there is true love, there will be action behind that love for the church family. You know, what, what is... Man, we can always look at God. We can always look at, whenever you're struggling in your life about what to do, just look at Jesus, man. Look at the example he gives to us. Does, does God just constantly talk about his love? Does, does John 3.16 go like this? For God so loved the word, world, period, amen? No. For God so loved the world, what? That he gave. There is action behind our love. If we truly love, there will be action behind it. How do we know the love of God? How do you know God loves you? Because he laid down his life for us. We are given the example of Christ's death on a cross as a demonstration for us of what true love is. Every time God talks about his love, he points back to the cross. Every time he talks about his love, he points back to the cross. He points to Jesus and the cross as proof of his love. And when, listen, when we, when we love in deed and in truth, we will be able to point to specific things in our life where we have loved and demonstrated the love of Christ in this church body. How do we know God loves us? Because he laid down his life for us. How do we know we have the love of God? Because a true Christ follower loves by offering up themselves. With the resources of the need and the knowledge of the need, God's people act to meet the needs of God's people because we love God's people. I ask you this this morning, child of God, where are the specific and personal acts of love you can point to in your life for this body? When we love in deed and in truth, we will be like Christ in the sense that we can point to the demonstration of our love for the family of God. Where can you in your life reflect on the action that your love for the body of Christ took place? Not in a prideful or an arrogant type of a way about look what I did, but in a way that gives you assurance and confidence of your faith and your standing in Christ. Because that's what John is writing to us and that's what John is wanting us to capture and want us to get this morning. A true follower of Christ loves by offering up themselves. Listen, maybe you've been hurt by the church in the past and you say, well, I'm done putting myself out there. I, I've been hurt too many times before. That, that's understandable. The pain is real and the scars can leave a lot of damage. But listen, be careful not to let that spirit of Cain creep into your life. Ultimately, Christian, we are called to love and not just in work or talk in word, but in deed and in truth. Because we have experienced the love of Christ, we offer up ourselves the way this, the Savior did for us. 
You know, this entire passage can be summed up by two words, love or hate. Cain's hatred propelled him to murder. Christ's love propelled him to self-sacrifice. You and I this morning, we fall into one or two of those camps. There's no middle ground. We either love or we hate this morning. We're either, we're either a child of God or we're a child of the devil this morning. That's it. What's our big idea this morning? Gospel love for the church identifies and assures the follower of Christ. A true follower of Christ loves by obeying the message, opposing the spirit of Cain, and offering up themselves. We want to close this morning with what we call learn to live. Let's be a church that's learning to live, right? If we just come here and, and, and to learn, we're just going to leave smarter sinners, right? We don't want to do that. We want to desire. We want to have a desire to be more like the Savior. We want to see growth and change in our life. So I've got three questions to pose to you this morning. Number one, have you experienced gospel love? Has there been a moment in your life where you experienced the love of God? If you, if you haven't this morning, I would plead with you today to answer the call of salvation. Christ demonstrated his love for us that while we were yet sinners, you don't have to get right to come to God. You can come as you are. God, God will clean you up. John says you can know, you can be sure of your passing from death into life. We can have confidence in our salvation. Have you experienced the gospel love this morning? Maybe you say, yes. Maybe you say, yes, I, I do have so much anger in my heart and hate. I want to know what it's like to be loved and to love. Accept the gospel call this morning. Accept the call of salvation today. Maybe you're someone that says, well, I'm a good person. You know, I try to treat everybody the same. But friend, John clearly says that we either love or we hate. Christ is calling out to you today as well. Number two, where do you need to battle the spirit of Cain? Where do you, Christian, need to battle the spirit of Cain? Anger, bitterness, jealousy, hate, envy. If we're not careful, we can begin to feel this way about our church family. Is there someone in your friend group, your life group that you have anger or jealousy towards? Get it right today. Confess to God and then confess to that brother or sister in Christ and grow in your love for one another and assurance in Christ. Look, let's not chalk up that, that interaction that we had as an uncomfortable conversation or an uncomfortable moment. Let's call it sin. If it was sin, let's call it sin and let's confess it and let's get it right. Let's not beat around the bush this morning. We don't want to allow the spirit of Cain to creep into this church. Maybe you're, you're so angry, you're so jealous, or you're envious, and you don't know what to do. Confess and seek the counsel and prayer of your church family. Maybe go to someone and say, hey, I'm really struggling with this in my life. I don't know what to do. The Bible says confession is good for the soul. Confess one to another. There can be healing and restoration today. And then number three, who can you show gospel love to? I'm not talking about High school musical love, okay? No high school sweetheart. No affection, no brotherly love. I'm talking about true, sacrificial, selfless love. Christian or Jesus follower, who in your life today do you need to show the love of God to? Listen, just because the world doesn't understand or, or what does the Bible say, hates us, that doesn't mean you don't have to show the love of Christ. The Bible tells us greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. We can boldly go to those in our life and share the love of Christ and share the gospel this morning. And listen, don't give an excuse. Well, I don't really have a good story to tell. I don't really have some, something to show or something to share. Listen, if you're in Christ and you have received the love of God in your own, you have your own story to tell, right? What is our mission statement at City Light? Come and see, go and tell. Let us be a church that lives on mission and does two things. Listen. Share the love we encounter with Christ. And number two, share the love we encounter with each other. Right? We want to come and see Jesus. We want to go and tell. We want to come and see the love of Jesus. And then we want to come and experience the love of one another. Because John clearly says, a true follower of Christ, or John clearly says the gospel love for the church identifies and assures the true follower of Christ. Let's pray this morning. Dear Lord, I thank you for your word.